If we look at the boiling points of ethanol and dimethyl ether, we can see there's a large difference between them. Ethanol has a much higher boiling point, uh, 78 degrees uh, Celsius, whereas dimethyl ether is negative 25 degrees. And this explains the state of matter of these molecules. Ethanol, since its boiling point is higher than room temperature, is of course a liquid at room temperature and pressure, whereas dimethyl ether with a much lower boiling point has already turned into a gas. And so we can explain the states of matter by looking at the intermolecular forces that are present in these molecules. So if I think about one molecule of ethanol, I know that the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is polarized. I know that oxygen is more electronegative, so it will be partially negative. And the hydrogen is partially positive as it loses some electron density. If that molecule of ethanol interacts with another molecule of ethanol, the second molecule of ethanol is also polarized. Right? The oxygen is partially negative, and the hydrogen is partially positive. And we know that opposite charges attract. So the partially positively charged hydrogen is attracted to the partially negatively charged oxygen like that. And there's going to be attraction between those two molecules. And we call this intermolecular force hydrogen bonding, right? the strongest type of intermolecular force. So hydrogen bonding is present between molecules of ethanol. And this accounts for its large boiling point. Let's look at uh, more details about hydrogen bonding here. So hydrogen bonding exists when you have hydrogen bonded to an electronegative atom like that, this oxygen. But students forget that you also need another electronegative atom over here to give you uh, to give you more of a difference in charge and to make that hydrogen more partially positive. So it's really it's really three atoms involved in hydrogen bonding there. Let's look at dimethyl ether and see why it does not exhibit hydrogen bonding. So if I were to draw one molecule of dimethyl ether here and think about the polarization. Uh, between the oxygen and this carbon right here. Oxygen is more electronegative, so it'll be partially negative. This, uh, this carbon be partially positive like that. If I think about the interaction of that molecule of dimethyl ether with another molecule of dimethyl ether like that, you might be tempted to say, uh, well, there could be some hydrogen bonding, right? Because I know that this carbon right here has some hydrogens attached to it. And so, some students will say, oh, there must be hydrogen bonding between you know, this oxygen down here and this hydrogen. Um, but that is not the case, because this hydrogen right here, while it is interacting with an oxygen, this hydrogen is bonded to a carbon, which is not very electronegative. And so there's no large differences in electronegativity in the bond between carbon and hydrogen, even though carbon's a little bit more electronegative. There's not enough to make this a true hydrogen bond. And so really, there's only a small amount of dipole-dipole interaction between two molecules of dimethyl ether. So somewhere on this second molecule, there's a partial negative, partial positive. And so there will be a little bit of dipole-dipole interaction, a little bit of dipole-dipole interaction here. Um, but it's not very strong, and it's certainly nowhere near as strong as the hydrogen bonding exhibited on the left, right? Hydrogen bonding being just the super strong form of dipole-dipole interaction. And so dimethyl ether does not have as high of a boiling point as ethanol. Again, the answer is hydrogen bonding. Let's see what happens to the boiling point of ethers as we increase uh, the number of carbons in the alkyl groups. All right, so if, we, uh, if we're going to look at dimethyl ether again, all right, and uh, let's compare that to an ether that has more carbons in the alkyl group, so diethyl ether. We've already seen the, the boiling point of dimethyl ether is approximately negative 25 degrees Celsius, whereas diethyl ether is about 35 degrees Celsius. And so there's a large difference in boiling points. Diethyl ether's boiling point is just higher than room temperature, so it is still a liquid um, at room temperature and pressure. So let's see if we can look at uh, why diethyl ether has a higher boiling point. All right, we know that ether molecules can't hydrogen bond with each other, so that cannot be the intermolecular force uh, responsible for this increase in boiling point. So if we look at two molecules of diethyl ether interacting, one of the other intermolecular forces that we discussed was London dispersion forces. Okay, so London dispersion forces, 
Right, you can watch the earlier video for more details. But when you have these large alkyl groups, it provides more surface area for a form of attraction called London dispersion. And so that increased attraction between alkyl groups means that it's, it's harder to pull those molecules apart. It requires more energy to pull those molecules apart. It requires more heat in order to do so. And so that's the reason for the increase in boiling point that we see uh, for diethyl ether up to 35 degrees Celsius. And even though Lund dispersion forces are the weakest intermolecular forces, um, they're additive. So the effect is added, is added as you, you know, when you have lots and lots of molecules. And, uh, and that's the reason for the large difference between dimethyl ether and for diethyl ether. And so the increase of the uh, uh, number of carbons in the alkyl groups increases the boiling point just above room temperature, but not much above room temperature. So this makes uh, diethyl ether um, an, excellent, uh, an, an excellent solvent for extraction. Um, it's, the other thing the alkyl groups do is they increase the, uh, the nonpolar part of the molecule, right? So it's a little bit more nonpolar due to these alkyl groups right here, which means that diethyl ether is very good for dissolving a lot of nonpolar organic compounds. And so if you can dissolve a lot of nonpolar organic compounds and the boiling point is just above room temperature, it's an excellent solvent for extraction because you can dissolve your nonpolar organic molecules. And then you can just boil off the ether and you're left with your organic product. Okay, so you'll use diethyl ether a lot for extractions. Let's look at uh, another type of ether, which is a kind of an interesting one, and we we call these ethers crown ethers. All right, so if you look at that gigantic ether there, it's called a crown ether. This is discovered by a guy named Charles uh, Peterson, who uh, who won the Nobel Prize for this, and the system of nomenclature for crown ethers would be to uh, first count up how many, how, many, how many atoms comprise your, your ring here, your crown. So if we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So there, there are 18, 18 parts of this crown. So we would write, we would write an 18 right here like that, followed by the name crown, followed by the number of oxygens in here. So we have, uh, we have one oxygen, two, three, four, five, and six. So the nomenclature would be 18 crown six ether. And that just tells you what sort of crown ether that you are dealing with. So why is it called a crown ether? Well, the interesting thing about crown ethers are that they can interact with different ions. For example, the size of the potassium ion, so K plus, happens to fit right in the center of this. So the spacing is just right for a potassium ion to fit in there. And since all of these oxygens right, have lone pairs of electrons on them, right, so negatively charged, uh, there's an attraction between the positively charged potassium ion and the negatively charged electrons or the partially negatively charged oxygen atoms. right? So there's, there's attraction, opposite charges attract, and uh, those negative charges are going to hold that potassium ion in here like that. So it looks like a crown. If you think about you know, the potassium ion as being you know, someone's head and then, and then just wearing this, this ether crown on someone's head like that. And crown ethers have proved to be very useful, very useful things. For example, if you had, uh, if you had some potassium uh, fluoride, right? so some K plus F minus, Right? Well, normally, potassium fluoride would not dissolve in a nonpolar organic solvent. But if you use a crown ether, right, the oxygens can take care of the potassium. Right? And the outside of the crown ether is, uh, is nonpolar. Right? So this portion and this portion, the outside of the crown ether is nonpolar, which will dissolve in an organic solvent, in a nonpolar organic solvent like benzene, like that. So like dissolves like. So this portion would dissolve in benzene. 
right? And then what that would do is that would free up your fluoride anion, right? That would increase the nucleophilic strength of your fluoride anion, which could participate in an SN2 reaction. So that's one of the uses of crown ethers is to um, is to go ahead and take the take the cation, leaving the anion to function as a better nucleophile because the potassium ion is solvated by the crown ether. And of course, since different ions have different sizes, you can you can get different sized crown ethers to take care of those ions. So crown ethers, uh, I just think, are very interesting, interesting molecules. And if you can look at a three-dimensional uh, representation of a crown ether, it's much easier to see uh, that the outside is, is very nonpolar. So interesting, interesting molecules.